All right, so today's lecture is on exploitation and calling opens. So lecture two, we covered starting hands uh, and then width to open from under the gun. Lecture three, we did a bunch of math. Lecture four, we covered which hands to open raise with and how to adjust that uh, from all of your other position. So now we're gonna switch it to, okay, when can I call someone else's open raise? So, wait, why is, uh, yeah. So quick review. Uh, fold equity, uh, just the, the core idea of a fold equity is we don't seem to win by having the best hand, we can get everybody to fold. Pot odds, uh, it tells us how much, how what percentage of the time we need to win to profitably call. Um, and when we're doing the formula, uh, we add their bet to the pot and then do the formula. So if the pot is 10 and they bet five, uh, the pot's now 15. So our formula would be five over 15 plus five. Uh, range charts aren't rigid. Uh, we like hands with implied odds, versatility, not potential. Um, a good pair of potential that you can see here. It's like ace jack offsuit has got a good pair of potential, and that's why we play it. Whereas a hand like 10 9 suited, we play because of his versatility. So, this is a long and verbose slide uh, to just say common sense. Like, you don't even have to read it, honestly. Um, we like it if our steel is more likely to work and they are more likely to fold. We also like it that if our steel doesn't work, that means that they call. We don't like getting three bet and having to fold. We like it if they call, and then we have a good chance of winning the hand after they call. Here we can see how we start adding more hands versus fish because we have more implied odds to get, and we want to get heads up with them and play pots with them. When we're facing late three betters, though, we have to play fewer hands to be able to defend against their aggression. And that takes into reasons to call opens. So um, but one concept that's going to be pretty like seen everywhere across this whole lecture and drives a lot of our decisions when it comes to calling hands is the gap concept. It's the idea that we need a stronger range to call an open than we would open raise from that position ourselves. So ace and offsuit is an open raise from the cutoff. We should not call versus an under the gun opening. There are three key reasons. Uh, the biggest one is that the under the gun range is very strong. Um, and we have lots of reverse implied odds with a hand like ace 10 offsuit. When they raise from under the gun, a lot of the time they'll have ace king, they'll have ace queen, they'll have ace jack, they'll have pocket aces, they might have pocket tens. They have all sorts of hands that might have us dominated. Um, and we're not doing well at all, a lot of reverse implied odds. Um, by just calling, we lose the initiative. We'll be facing bets rather than making them. Uh, we have less full equity and we get put in tough situations often. Uh, because we three bet our strongest hands, we have a capped range. We're not, we don't have pocket aces and we call it raise preflop. We don't have pocket kings either. Um, we are admitting that we don't have our best hands and that makes us very attackable by our opponents. So there's three reasons why calling isn't great. Um, so even still, we're gonna call decently often. And so the question is, is what are the reasons we could justify a call? And there are four of them. Uh, so we're gonna go start here with reason one. Uh, reason one is being in good shape. So being in good shape means is that our hand is in good enough to just call and we're doing pretty, our, it, as we have a pretty good chance of winning if we just call, uh, we have a decent amount of equity. If we three bet for value and get called or raised, we don't stand a chance. Our hand is not good enough to justify a three bet for value. Um, and we wouldn't want to raise a bluff with a hand that's good enough to call anyway. Why not bluff with a trash hand? Why should we bluff with a hand we could just call with? Um, so the end result of that is we just end up calling a bunch of their hands that are okay, that do decent, that do well enough. So the question is, is okay, how do we know, what does it mean for a hand to do well enough and it means that we flop hands that will be ahead of a sizable part of villain's value range post flop. So villain has a strong opening range when they when they raise under the gun, for example, they've got strong hands. So their value range, their their range of good hands are top pairs, pair of aces, or have over pairs, pocket aces on like jack seven four, something like that. So we want to be able to flop hands that can beat those hands. Why? Because objectively, when we just flat call. We're, we're going to have to fold most of the time pre-flop. We're gonna to have to fold over half of the time on post-flop, sorry, because of all those disadvantages you mentioned with the gap concept. So when we end up, we end up making a hand and we do end up winning, we can't just win by a little bit. We need to win a lot of money to justify 
culling. So how do we, we need to be able to extract value. So how do we know if we're in good shape versus their opening range? Uh, it, two things, it's what position they raised from. We went over all those range charts. Under the gun has a strong opening range. The button has a weak one. What kind of player is villain? If they're a nit raising under the gun, oh, you best believe they might. They could have aces and kings. If they're a weak aggro fish uh, on the button, then we don't have to put much credence in them having strong hands. So here is an example. And we're going to go over quite a few hands here versus a pretty standard under the gun opening range. So the reg is running a 2218. That's pretty much close to perfect. Um, the X's represent there is no set designation for whole cards here. Uh, we're not concerned what to do with one exact hand. We want to decide to do with any hand to give us a complete strategy of, okay, what should our range look like and why? So we're going to assume that reg is playing a standard under the gun open percentage of around 14%. This is a bit higher than our 11%, but remember our 11 is conservative. So we're going to say that it's about a 14 default. So let's visualize it. We plug in this 14% default and you get this chart on the right here. For, for now, just look at the blue boxes on the right. And this is pretty much what villain is open raising. These are the hands we expect villain to have. So we're going to look over a bunch of hands we could be considering calling with and seeing how we will fare against this opening range. So queen jack offsuit is not in good shape. It only has 35% equity. So what do we mean by this? If when we're, when we've talked about equity before, it's been like ace pocket aces versus king queen suited. What's the probability pocket aces makes the best hand. So you can actually end up averaging out the equity of our hand versus their range. So we know that these blue boxes are the only hands they can have, right? And because of that, we know, oh, there are six different ways they can have pocket queens there because you can, there's, you can pick four of one suit, three of another. So that's 12. You have to divide by two because it wouldn't matter if we had gone hearts, spades or spades, hearts. So you get six combinations. So we're, we're going to do this a lot more later, but for now, just know we can kind of get an, a rough average of how our hand does against their hand. So we only have 35% equity. On average, our hand sucks and is getting destroyed by their range. But more importantly, say we do flop a queen, flop a pair of queens, we should be happy. Well, ace queen off kills us, king queen off kills us, pocket queens kills us, king queen suited, ace queen suited gets us, um, queen jack suited ties, like that's not great. And jacks as well, if we make a pair of jacks, we're still getting dominated very often. So that has a bunch of reverse implied odds and negative effects for us. So now let's consider cold calling in position with these hands. And by the way, cold calling just means you call before you've done anything else. So if we raise and then got three bet and then we call, that's not like cold, but just we're just calling as our first action. So um and and you'll we'll, we'll do later the significance of what it means like why an action being cold is different from it being i don't know hot no one really calls it a hot action but acting after you've acted before anyway so for simplicity's purpose we're going to group hands that we're talking about that are pretty similar king queen off and ace jack off are similar hands so similar like as with before we have domination issues um our king queen will get wrecked when they have ace queen when they have ace king uh, when they have kings, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so we suffer from domination issues. Same thing goes for ace-jack offsuit. Um, it doesn't help there are four players left to go if we're in the hijack here um, and we're debating whether to call. Because um, by the way, th this, this range we're building here is from the hijack. Uh, we should lean towards a fold, which sounds crazy. We're folding king-queen offsuit, but yes. If we're against a strong, competent, under-the-gun player that, um, and we expect the players behind us also to be uh, aggressive enough, raising enough often to put us in some danger. Um, we should lean towards a fold. Calling isn't bad. We should definitely lean towards the fold here. Um, in reality, a lot of times the undergun player is not good, tight, defensive player, and we can we can totally call. Like I'm usually calling with my king queen offsuit. But again, if I, if I'm playing at a strong table and this has happened many times, I say nope. I'm playing ABC poker. No king queen for me. So now we're talking. These hands are good. So again, by that equity averaging, we have 53, 50, 46% respectively. So we're winning half the time or more against their whole range of hands. But that isn't all. We still have some domination issues, like ace-jack still will get dominated by ace-king, ace-queen, king-jack, jack-queen-jack, um, or wait, no. We'll still get dominated by ace-king, ace-queen. Sorry, this is like my third or fourth recorded lecture in a row. 
starting to take its toll. Um, King Queen suited will get dominated by Ace King, Ace Queen. Um, so we have reverse implied odds there, but now we also have implied odds from maybe being able to make flushes and straights. So it kind of equals out. So we should always call or raise. So when maybe not, it says always call, but you could really consider a raise with a lot of these hands. Um, if you think under the gun is not playing like tight hands, if they're playing, if they're playing super tight, then yeah, we might be, we will, we'll just flat call. So this part is surprising probably to most people. So ace king offsuit, fantastic. Pocket queens, fantastic. Uh, monsters, we're at the very least going to call these. You don't even need to think about it. There should be three bet for value. So right now, if we average our equity out, we have 58%, 67% equity. Um, after we decide to go through and three bet, um, if we get four bet or if they just call, but especially if we get four bet, we now have domination issues. If they four bet us to a huge amount with a and we have ace king, it's really uncomfortable because what if they have aces? What if they have kings? What do we do? If we four bet and then with queens and then they four and or we three bet and then they four bet us with with um when we have queens it's terrible it sucks because they're really only going to be four betting us mostly with pocket aces pocket kings ace king suited ace king off and against kings and aces we're destroyed and against ace king we're like flipping a coin so here's here's the problem with if we were to just raise even though these hands look super good we don't do well against the range villain continues with if, if the range villain decides to raise with, we're getting toasted a lot of the time, and the range villain decides to just call with, we're still like, it's not great for us. Um, when we just flat call, we can crush a lot of pairs in villain's range. So when they call, they might, there's a whole other host of weaker hands they could expect us to have. And now their ace queen is the one feeling the pain. Their ace jack is the one feeling the pain. When we raise, it can be tough. Um, yeah, again, this is a situation of are we playing a really good opponent or are we just playing someone who in reality isn't that awesome? Because I am I am very often, a, I'm going to three bet ace king offsuit. I actually do kind of lean towards a call with pocket queens versus an under the gun open just because the domination issues are worse because aces, kings will just end our lives room and not fun. So, yeah, these hands suck. Pocket aces, kings are terrible. Never play them. Yeah. The, the first lecture I did this in, everyone was like, what? I'm joking. Come on. Uh, we're going to we're gonna three bet these hands. We've got a ton of equity, even when villain continues. So we already have insane equity. I think it's like, I remember I got the number of like 90 plus percent or something like that um, <clears throat> before the three bet. And even after the three bet, we've got a ton of equity. So yeah, of course, we're going to raise and bump our good hands up. So that's reason one. All of these we're, we're considering, should we call because we're doing good enough? Now, reason two, implied odds. Uh, we like nines through jacks, both because we can spike sets. We've got those implied odds to spike the sets, and also because they're just decent pairs. Uh, we can defend against bets post-flop. A lot of the time, pocket jacks could be an overpair, for example. Like, board comes two, four, seven. All of these pairs are overpairs, which is great. Um, so sets are sneaky disguised. We like sets. We've talked about them. So definitely an easy call. Like, if we look at under the guns range here, and say we have nines, uh, we can give aces, kings, ace, king, very bad day when we flop a set and they make a pair. So let's look at some of these lower pocket pairs now, sixes, sevens, and eights. We have now lost our ability to have decent pairs when we miss the set. Like pocket eights, like a lot of these pairs will still be middle pairs. Pocket eights could be top pair sometimes, or it could be like the board is nine, nine, six, two. And pocket eights isn't doing too bad there, right? We're a middle pair, we're close to best. But here's the problem with some of these weaker middling pairs uh, is the small pocket pair curse. So say that we, we decide to call or we, we decide to call and our opponent whiffs the flop. They have ace king and they miss. And we're currently ahead with our pocket eights. We only have two outs to make three of a kind. There's two eights left in the deck. That's not very common. If they had paired their ace, we only have two outs to improve to the best hand. Um, and let's and on the contrary. If ace king doesn't pair and we have our eights, they have three aces and three kings as outs. So essentially, when we're behind, it's very unlikely we'll make a hand. When we're ahead, like a full quarter of the time, our opponent will improve to the best hand. And also, it's a very uncomfortable situation to play. Say we have pocket eights, 
and the board comes like what queen seven six or something um or even more realistically like queen nine six that happens a lot while our opponent starts betting and we have pocket eights they've missed the flop with their ace king but that doesn't matter to us we have third pair and as the turn card and the river card comes our pair becomes worse and worse so just not comfortable uh that being said still these aren't bad hands it sounds like i'm about to say that we should fold uh we need to think about what justifies calling for implied odds what justifies mining for sets here there are seven factors at play. And again, it's, it's lots of words and lots of like over conceptualization of stuff that can be made simpler. So the way I like to think of implied odds is as we're just making a one-time one-off bet. When, when we're considering whether we wanna make this bet, we wanna know the potential payoff, the probability that the bet like succeeds that we win and the cost to play. And those are the three things we care about. So cost to play, size of investment, we would prefer to call for implied odds if it's cheap. Frequency of big hand is probability that the bet pays off. Villain's range strength. So this one is uh might be is, is probably the most nuanced point of all of them. Uh, villain needs to have a strong hand to call big bets. So under the gun, we have a lot of implied odds against versus like the button. The button has a lot of weak garbage hands they're stealing with. They have less implied odds. So that would factor into the likelihood bet pays off side. Stack size uh, is how much we stand to win. If villain only has 10 bucks behind, we can't call a huge bet thinking, oh, but what if I make my hand? Well, there's only 10 bucks left to win. Uh, we need them to have like 100 big blinds or a good chunk of money left behind. Villain's aptitude to fold. Um, that is again, payoff. If we make our set and then they fold, well, that sucks for us. We prefer if they were a fish and will call us down. Uh, here, villain's a reg, they'll call us enough. Uh, we like the pot to go multi-way for implied odds. So one, there's just more people to call. And two, uh, because there's more people, it's more likely one of them made a hand. Um, and position, so this is an also a bit nuanced. When we're in position, we have that flexibility we've talked about. We have the ability to extract value. We're the one who really is controlling the flow of the hand, the pacing, and how the action plays out. So let's go over the seven factors. It's cheap for us to call here. We're gonna make our set with six through eights pretty often. Villain's got a strong range. They've got a hundred big blinds. They're not gonna to fold too much. The pot could totally go multi-way because there's four people left to go and we have position. So every one of the seven factors is in our favor. So we can justify a call with these. Now, twos through fives, we've reached the cutoff point. They are significantly worse. They are totally incapable of making a decent pair. Uh, we can also get owned by set over set situations. So it doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, we're always going broke. You notice under the gun here has pocket aces through pocket sevens. Um, say probability you flop a set is one ninth, probability they flop a set is one ninth. Um, don't quote me, that's, the probability is probably less than that. Let's say one out of 100 times we both flop sets. Well, still, when that happens, we lose 200 big blinds. So that's like minus two big blinds in EV right there from the set over set situation, because it's more likely when we've got these tinier baby sets. And as we get up to larger sets, it's less of a, less of an issue. Um, yeah. So we don't like these, we're gonna fold these. And also another, a key, another point is with four people left to act, these hands cannot defend against aggression or squeezes. So if, if we have pocket jacks and someone behind us raises, well, we're not always folding. We can justify calling plenty. Twos, you have to let go. So it's, it's not as good of a hand, we're gonna fold. The last of the implied odds hands we're gonna look at are the suited connectors um, kind of hands. So surprisingly, they look really pretty, but they have a lot less implied odds in pocket pairs because flushes and straights are less common. So we flop a set 12%-ish of the time. For Jack-10 suited, we'll only flop a hand concretely two pair or better 5.6% of the time. Your reminder, two pair is worse than three of a kind. So we're less than half as likely to flop as strong of a hand or even close to as strong of a hand. That being said, we'll flop a really strong draw about 7% of the time and a pretty strong draw about 13% of the time. You add these together, 25% of the time we get something, we get a chunk of the board, but remember that draws aren't actually a made hand yet, we need them to hit. So draws are much less powerful. So it isn't quite callable versus under the gun with players left to act unless we have other factors giving us implied odds. So we're supposed to fold these. And again, 
<laughs> I can, I am not folding these very often. I might fold 10, nine suited. Or again, if I have, if I'm up against good opponents, then yeah, definitely folding 10, nine suited. Um, bad opponents. I'm for sure seeing a flop with my Jack 10. It's all about the implied odds. When you play live low stakes poker, it's mostly like passive fish or just loose fish that we'll call big bets. So we want to want to play more of these implied odds kind of hands. So that's reason two. So, so far we've added a lot of these pocket pairs in, we've added some of these implied odds hands. We've added some of the really strong, good pair potential kind of hands with some versatility um, to our range charts, kind of getting an image of what it might look like. Uh, reason three is weaker players. So this is, I'm broken record. Um, it is very hard for me to fold eight, seven suited in the button versus an under the gun open. I am probably calling this most of the time. If my opponent is really good, it's an easy fold. Here though, uh, even though under the gun player is good, we gotta show them respect. Um, what we have in our advantage is the small blind and the big blind. Um, we, have, we have a hand that can make straights and flushes because the small blind and the big blind are so loose, aggressive, uh, they're the pot is going to go multi-way, so that's another factor for our implied odds. And then uh, another key point is when there's four people in the pot, you can bluff less. We're going to go over this very soon, I think lecture seven. Um, but because of this, under the gun has to play very straightforwardly. They can't get aggressive or get out of line. They either make a good hand and bet, or they just have to give up and fold. So here's a situation where if it was just us versus under the gun in a vacuum, we fold. But because we can expect these aggro players to come along, we play. Yeah, we like also something that someone brought up in lecture was, hey, wait, there's an aggro fish in the big blind. I thought we don't like that because we're going to get three bet and then we don't, then that sucks. We have to fold here. It's different because this aggro fish is so crazy and we'll be out of position to us post flop. We'll love it if they're just shoveling money to us and we make a good hand because they're so aggressive where you can just go call, 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 call when we make our hand and then just print money. Last point. Pot odds make calling better than folding. So this is mainly a thing in the blinds. Um, when we're in the big blind, we've already paid one, dot, one big blind. We're not getting that back, so we don't factor that into our call. So it ends up being a pretty big difference. If we uh, plug in the uh, we plug in the value, it's 10% less uh, pot odds needed than from if we call from say the button or in the hijack. So it's a pretty big difference, uh, which incentivizes us to call and play more hands but it's also totally negated by the fact that we are out of position versus under the gun. So we still need to be quite careful. So here's a quick example. Again, um, this is like this, this top paragraph, don't worry too much about it. If you do some fancy math stuff, you get that we have 44% equity against their average hand. Um, and we also can't really get strong hands or we don't have many implied odds. So, if this was a three big wind open, we say, okay, I fold them done, I give up, white flag. But we're still totally gonna call. Our pot odds are 22%. This, we only need to win one out of five hands. Um, if we're gonna envision realistic scenarios, 17% of the time we'll get a pair of kings. So just from that, we can justify really calling. Like that's a pair of kings is probably gonna be the best hand. All right. So now we can actually start talking about calling ranges. We've covered all of the reasons to call. We've covered uh, the gap concept, which explains, hey, we do want to call fewer hands in the open raise. So getting into it. Uh, so there's a few guiding principles in whether to call open outside of these reasons. So the closer to the button, the more hands we're going to call, just because position will be stronger and there's few people behind that can squeeze us. So squeezing is gonna be in a few slides, but to get squeezed is when we call a raise and someone else re-raises over the top. Again, when we call, we admit we don't have that strong of a hand. So someone squeezing us is basically them giving us the middle finger and saying, fold, I'm gonna take your money. Uh, it's very annoying and uncomfortable. We don't like getting squeezed. Uh, versus tight ranges, we like the implied odds hands and versus looser ranges, we like hands with good pair potential. Um, you're gonna see this visually and how the, the range charts end up looking. And of course, we like to call bets if they have better pot odds in our favor. So here, wait, whoops. Here is our first range chart uh, for calling. Now, I want you first to just kind of notice the shape here. Uh, if you notice with a lot of our previous range charts, they kind of got this thing where there's, there's hands on the main diagonal and then there's hands going along the top right and then hands going around the left side edge. And here it's like 
the entire thing is like basically the diagonal. And the point is what factors we really care about when we're playing these hands. So as we were talking about, we said that we don't like hands like ace 10 offsuit anymore because they don't have good pair potential anymore. They, there's so much reverse implied Osbers under the gun that we really want to stay away from those. So we stay away from these good pair potential-ish hands that aren't good enough. Um, we said that we really like these implied odds hands because they've got a strong range and we want to be able to take all the money from that strong range. Because of that, that also leads to us, we want to play some suited hands, some versatile hands. So then we end up with this, where implied odds is really the big factor we're considering. So nut potential is the big factor we care about. Um, and again, these are hands that are playable. Like, of course, we're probably going to play like, three bet aces every damn time. Um, so here it's just listed as a playable hand. And it illustrates how careful we need to be. Ace jack offsuit is not a call. People will call, call this thing in their chill and they'll lose a bunch of money. Let's see versus later positions. So one, we're just playing more hands, period, uh, versus a hijack open because they have fewer good hands. But also, if you notice, we're starting to play more. It's starting to look a little bit more like our, our normal diagrams here. Where now we're playing some king jack offsuit, ace jack offsuit. We're playing more of the good pair potential ish hands. Um, oh, whoops. Yeah. So the small medium pairs are still decent, um, and we have we have enough good hands to ensure that our applied odds are reasonable. If we're only calling a lot of times with like with with like uh, I never I know a hijack is the one who's got enough good hands that we have the implied odds to justify, but we're not implied to play the purely implied odd hands from the cutoff. Um, like the twos through fives because the button and blinds could interfere by squeezing and that sucks because we don't like getting squeezed with pocket twos. Yeah, flatting them on aggressive tables equates to folding far too much. Now you see it's looking like a lot more our, like our standard range here where there's less on the diagonal and then more on the, the top the, the, the top axis and then more on the left side. Um, when you call versus the cutoff and the button, it's very adversarial. The cutoff steals really wide and the button calls really wide. So there's a lot of disbelief either player has a strong hand. Um, if there's tight three betters behind, we're going to flat an even wider range. You get pocket twos through five, suited connectors, yada, yada. Um, we don't like calling with these hands as a default because it goes back to that we want to play against strong ranges with our implied odds hands. Say so we make a set with our pocket twos and the cutoff was raising some like seven, six suited that didn't hit anything. Well. They're not going to call our bets. So implied odds are lower. Now, we're never going to call from the small blind. If you notice, all of these charts say from, from button facing raise, because we don't like calling from the small blind. Um, we're going to either do a three bet or fold strategy. There's a few key points here. So we're guaranteed to be out of position. Um, so post flop will be people behind us. No fun. Uh, and because we just called, we've capped our range. We've, we've just said, hey, I don't have that good of a hand. Also, you get to go after me. So if, please feel free to put the pressure on. Uh, and lastly, we don't even close the action. The big blind can still act. So we call preflop, and all of a sudden it's looking real pretty for the big blind to raise it up and force us to fold. And it's called a squeeze to apply pressure. Last point that wasn't on this slide is, wait, what? what, what? I don't know how I just did that, that was impressive. So we can call raises from the big blind. Um, and the big difference between the big blind and the small blind is one, pot odds are worse. Small blind, you've only put out half a big. Big blind, you've put out a whole big. Pot odds suck. Uh, and we're not closing the pre-flop action with a call. Um, from the small blind, we are in the big, like we talked about. Uh, and the last point is the big blind is the least profitable position in poker. Because by default, we lose one big blind every hand. So our goal is to minimize the amount we lose, not necessarily to win money. So calling out of position in the big blind. Again, uh, this is a, arguably pretty tight, but we will maintain the stay tight and then learn to be less tight. Um, the mistake that a lot of people can make is they just way over call. They'll call anything from the big blind. They'll call king three suited because they heard you're supposed to call more. Um, the big difference between the big blind and in position is set mining drops in value. So twos through fives, not as valuable. And the whole point is that when we're not in position, we can't extract value as well. Um, we're also going to be subject to more aggression because we're going to be out of position. Um, so it's no fun.
Yeah. Yeah. Gab concept is in effect here. We are playing a much tighter range versus each position we need to open. So funny, the big blind can't open raise, but um, it's still tighter than um, we would open for every position. So healthy approach. Uh, the hands we call have enough implied odds, flop strong hands, or, or both, to outweigh the positional disadvantage we have. So calling in the big blind versus the buttons. I want you to look at these charts. Look at this huge jump here in hands that we play. Uh, the whites are the ones that we're typically going to be playing. That's that's a lot more hands that we've decided to add during our opening range here. And uh, why? Wait, why? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, also the orange is the as if it was a 2.5x range and the brown is versus a 2x range. So for us, white is $6, orange is $5, uh, brown is $4. So I hope it makes sense that we're getting better pot odds when they raise to smaller amounts. So it justifies playing more hands. Um, yeah, so we can start to rely less and less and less on justifications to call of being in good shape and implied odds and this or that. Like we're going to call with Jack 7 offsuit. That doesn't have implied odds. It's not in good shape. It's just literally we will win 30% or something of the time, and that's enough mathematically to justify a call here. Um, there's a common urge that say someone races to four bucks versus you, um, and you're in the big blind. You feel insulted that they think they could get you to fold with the min raise, so you're going to three bet it. You're going to bump it up and apply pressure. You actually want to three bet less, if anything, in this situation because – the risk versus reward of calling, it's very little risk with potentially a lot of reward. And of three betting, it's a lot of risk with less potential reward. So it's a strategic blunder. Don't do that. Uh, last point is if you notice, the difference between a 3x and a 2.5x is a lot of hands. All of a sudden, we're calling way more hands. But we've talked about how most opponents aren't creative enough to like don't pay enough attention to realize, hey, they're only raising to five, not six. I should play more hands. Uh, so again, it's a great source of expected value to raise to five from the button and cut off. All right. Last, uh, I think last thing here. Yeah, last thing. So this is calling in the big blind, the white um, versus button. Now versus small blind. You see how it's even crazier how many hands we're playing? If the small blind is min raising, we're almost playing every single hand at this point. We're playing like, six, like 60, 70% of hands. Um, from the big blind's perspective here, so we talked about small versus big before we were the small blind and raising. Now we're in the big blind and calling. Um, we're going to be in position post flop. Um, fun for us, the small blind has a weak range, uh, especially at lower stakes. Small blind openers are very, very fit or fold, very, very exploitable, and they give up so easy. They just think like, ah, it's a tiny, it's a tiny pot. I'm out of position. This sucks. I'll give up. Um, so we are incentivized to call aggressively here, even more than this chart might suggest, where we're just want to play a lot of hands. All right. So final thoughts. None of these charts are close to a fixed strategy. We should feel inclined to go off in exploitative directions if we find some flaw or imbalance in our opponent's game, pre-flop or post-flop. Uh, this solid basic strategy we gave you is only half the battle. The last is using your poker brain to adopt it to the situation at hand. So that's why we spend all the time explaining these factors instead of saying, here's your chart, do this thing. Uh, you're not supposed to memorize the charts, but they, they give you a good starting point and help you roughly frame which hands we should be calling with. And then just visually as to why. Again, I, when I think about my calling range here, I think about, oh, well, I want implied odds, so I want it on the diagonal. Like I kind of visualize it that way. Yeah. So we haven't talked about three betting either. So some of these, some of these hands would be three bet. We're going to need more colors. Um, yeah, there's nothing much really else to say here. Wow. I uh, talk really fast when it's over Zoom as compared to lecture. because This is 34 minutes in to what took 50 in person. But anyway, uh, see you in the next lecture.